please walk out to the courtyard out there so that we can take a group photo. Uh, so I'll just stand there. Uh, not even really helping. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll stand up on the stairs and take a photo down. So Okay, so. Yes. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You'll, you'll get uh, multiple copies of that sent to you. Uh, okay, great. Let's get started. All righty. Welcome back from lunch. My name is Eva. Um, I'm a system professor at uh, Georgia Tech and Emory in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Um, my talk today is going to be a bit of a departure from some of the other things that you guys have, have seen so far. I'm not actually going to have a tutorial component, um, but I have a lot of references and links at the end. And so if anyone's interested in applying some of these ideas to different data sets or has more questions and wants some specific you know, code to point to, I'm happy to provide some of that information. So what I'll be talking about today is um, different tools for dimensionality reduction and so finding some low dimensional structure from potentially very high dimensional data sets. I work in, um, in computational neuroscience, so a lot of the things that we apply these tools to are neural data sets, but at the beginning I'm gonna talk about it some, sort of from a more abstract and higher level view, and then I'm going to, if time permits, uh, go into two different applications or examples of these sorts of tools in different cellular level uh, neural data sets. So the first one will be something from motor cortex. So being able to decode movements from, from brain activity at the in individual cellular level. And then the second part is actually applying these tools to the Allen's Brain Observatory data set, which you'll hear about in a lot more detail in the second or in the presentation later today. So I thought it'd be nice to sort of give a um, you know, some information about how these things could be applied to that data set even before you see them, and then you'll know a lot more details later. So um, the sort of motivation for a lot of this is, you know, we've been talking about neural data sets, we've been thinking about how to handle large data sets either through pipelining or, you know, perhaps parallel processing of data. Um, another approach for dealing with high dimensional data, which isn't necessarily, you know, partitioning and parallel processing, but it's taking the data and trying to find some sort of lower dimensional description of it, which should be helpful for a number of different reasons that we'll go into. So just as some motivating, I think a lot of you here um, perhaps are working on things maybe at this scale, so using fMRI or perhaps DTI or even ECOG data sets. Um, and then as I said, a lot of the stuff that we do in my lab is at a um, more of a meso or a micro scale and so we think a lot about how individual neurons and their firing patterns could give rise to some sort of um, you know percept or uh, lead to some sort of uh, encoding of sensory or motor information within the brain. And so I don't think I need to spend too long motivating the reasons why um, perhaps finding low dimensional structure in these sorts of data sets might be applicable um, because we do have a lot of data and we need to think of something to do with it to make some sense of it. So, um, so these are so some of the applications. Oh, all right. I wonder what happened there. Keynote, quit, wow. All right, well, large scale data sets running in the background apparently or something's happening. Let me try to see if we can get this going again. Oh, here we are, okay. And then, can I see how to... Some technical difficulties? Okay, um, so, you know, as a starting point, we could ask the question of why might we want to reduce the dimensionality of data? And so, I have some answers here, but does anyone want to tell me some ideas of, you know, why dimensionality reduction um, or why finding a simpler description of your data could be useful. Yes, what's that? Yes, that's a very good point. And that's something that, you know, we would like to be able to do with these low dimensional models is 
have some sort of representation that allows us to interpret the data set more uh, succinctly or you know more in a in a more comprehensive way um, of course also when we reduce the dimensionality this gives us a way of compressing our data so there is just this um, aspect of having a smaller amount of numbers to deal with so that's this compression piece another thing that we'll sort of dig into a bit more is this aspect where if you have a low dimensional model for your data and then some of the data points live off of that low dimensional model um, kind of smashing them on to that say subspace or whatever else as we'll talk about with PCA also gives you a way of denoising or removing artifacts from your data potentially um, and then this, this third part about interpretability is really great um, and that's sort of probably one of the harder things to, to hope for from these techniques. Um, but, if, but if we're lucky, we can find some ways of, of interpreting these data sets in this lower dimensional space. So those are some of the three main motivations for why we might want to reduce the dimensionality. And so with that, I'm going to I'm going to set up this sort of abstract framework that we'll be working with, and then I'm going to lead you through a number of different low dimensional models. And at each point, we're going to look at the geometry of the data, so, uh, and we'll dig into what that means. Uh, I'm going to have some math for those of you that like math and, and want to look at optimization and objective functions, and then I'll also give an algorithm. So all three pieces will have a geometric interpretation, we'll have an algorithmic interpretation, and a mathematical formulation of it. And so as we step through all these, please ask questions at any point, interrupt me, because I, I hope this can be more tutorial, and then we can dig into some applications at the end. Okay. Okay, so this is the sort of setup. For us, we think about um, building a matrix of data, which typically is uh, ordered as neurons by time. But if you're talking about fMRI or ECOG, this could be voxels or channels by time. Um, there's many different ways to you know, potentially build up a matrix like this. And so uh, in the talk, I'll think about reducing, so each of the columns of the matrix is a data point. So in this case, I have basically at each point in time, all the neurons form some sort of state or a high dimensional representation in the neural space. And then we have many of those observations across many points in time. You could think about transposing this matrix and doing a lot of the same things that we're talking about and then operating on, you know, at the time level rather than at the, um, the population level of these neurons. So we have this matrix, we're going to call it Y. It consists of all these different data points, Y1 all the way to Yn. And so we can now interpret each of these columns as this point in some high dimensional space. In this case, where we can only see it in, you know, in the plane or visualize things in 3D, but you could imagine these points sort of occupy, occupying some portion of this high dimensional space. Okay, and so now we have a lot of the points and um, the goal of a lot of dimensionality reduction techniques is to find, oh, that didn't show up. There should be a yellow, um, plane, in this case, that sort of encapsulates all these data points. And so in this case, the idea of PCA or linear dimensionality reduction techniques is to basically find a subspace or a plane that basically approximates all these data points. So we'd like to find a, a plane that sort of captures as much of the variance of the data as possible. Um, so you could imagine, you know, having a lot of data points in the plane and maybe a few of them are slightly off of the plane, right? But in this case, we could still say that this particular subspace is a good approximation to all these data points. What I was saying before about denoising, right, is that if you have a few that live off of the plane, if you learn the plane for the data, you can basically, you know, smash them back onto the plane, Right, and then that gives you a way of sort of removing the noise in those specific data points. Does this make clear, is, this, or is it clear the sort of geometric interpretation of, yes, okay, and yes. So, just to be clear, like, those points aren't ever all going to fall on the plane, right? They're mostly going to be near the plane. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and maybe there, maybe it's not a plane, but maybe it's some sort of curved surface, and we'll we'll kind of step through. We're going to start with planes, and then we're going to add in more complexity. 
And but you're entirely correct. I mean, all of these are going to be some approximation to the actual structure of the data. And the hope is that if they do all live close to this plane, by for, by fitting it to the data, we have a um, we have a better handle on the sort of structure across all these data examples. I think the other thing to note here, and we'll again we'll get into more detail, but you know a lot of the, uh, a lot of the tools for dimensionality reduction rely first on looking at the covariance. So basically looking at how correlated are all of the individual data points with each other. So you look at these pairwise correlations and that sort of forms the basis for a lot of your um, interpretations of, of the geometry or uh, what the low dimensional structure of the data looks like. Okay, so what I'm going to do next, as promised, is I'm going to talk about these different signal models, and then I'm going to actually, I don't know, if you guys don't like, if some people like the math, I'll go through some detail. You can ask me more questions, but I just, I want to write it up there because there are, with a lot of these tools, there's a statistical or this sort of geometric interpretation, so I'd like for everyone to sort of know what the underlying objective function is when you fit the different models. Okay, so the first case is this linear subspace, which we've talked about, and PCA is sort of one of the core algorithmic techniques that's used to fit these linear structures. Okay, so the underlying objective function here is written out. How many of you have seen this sort of notation before? Okay, great, awesome. Um, so this is our objective function. So we're trying to minimize and find a matrix A, which matches our data Y in terms of the Frobenius norm, which is basically just the L2 or the sum of squares error, but at a matrix level. So it's, it's basically like putting an L2 norm here, but it's for matrices. All right, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a good approximation to our data in terms of its sum of squared error, subject to this constraint that the rank of this matrix is bounded. So who knows what the rank of a matrix is? Or does someone want to tell me? It looks like a good, yeah, good number of. Perfect. So this sort of tells us the dimension of this subspace that we're fitting to the data. Um, so if my rank is two, then I, basically what I'm saying is I'm fitting a two-dimensional plane. Um, and then in higher dimensions, things get a little harder to visualize, but it's the same idea. Um, oh, and I actually had a nice step through of all this. Okay, so we have our data matrix. That, that A is our low rank approximation. Um, these are the constraints, and then you know this is the rank constraint. Um, okay, and so um, one solution to this problem is actually found by forming the SVD, the singular value decomposition of the data matrix. Um, and so what I'm showing here uh, to sort of demonstrate the idea of using the singular value decomposition is if we use, this is MATLAB notation, but if we take the SVD of our matrix and then we basically plot um, the diagonal entries in this S matrix, we're going to see our singular values. And the idea is that if they decay quickly, this tells us something about how low dimensional our data actually is. Um, and so the solution to this problem basically involves taking the SVD of the matrix and then truncating each of these uh, matrices so that it only keeps the top K principal components um, or singular vectors in this case. And we do the same truncation on both the U and the V and the S, and then we multiply them all together, and that gives us our rank K approximation to the data. Any questions? Are people familiar with this sort of idea of using SVD and how it connects to PCA? Okay, cool. All right, um, and so if we then write out this algorithm associated with PCA, we're going to compute the covariance matrix C. So it's basically taking the mean um, 
uh, of our data, subtracting it, and then ba basically taking the, the correlation between those two after we center the data by subtracting its mean. So we're going to compute this covariance matrix on our centered data. Then we're going to compute an eigenvalue to composition of that matrix, which is equivalent to basically doing the SVD on the original matrix. Um, we can talk more details about that. And then our output is going to be the top k eigenvectors and their associated eigenvalues. All right, so we've gone through now um, the basics of principal components analysis is sort of the vanilla version of linear dimensionality reduction that I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. Um, then there's extensions of PCA, and so a lot of these extensions are basically meant to provide a way to still find a linear subspace, but to do it even if you have different amounts of noise or artifacts in your data. So the first extension is called robust PCA or um, PCA lasso, I guess. I think, you guys, I think you talked a bit about the PCA lasso um, in the scikit-learn tutorial from what I understand. Is that correct? Ish? Oh, you didn't? Okay. So our, from, uh, how about lasso? This idea of sparsity. Yeah, so lasso basically gives us a way of promoting sparse representations of data. And so what robust PCA basically does is it is a combination of PCA and then has an L1 or a sparsity uh, promoting prior. Um, and so what that does is, okay, so if each of our data points, Y can be modeled as A times X, where A is this low rank matrix plus some noise, then what robust PCA basically does is it assumes that uh, this noise only corrupts a small number of possible data points. So basically everything lives very close to the plane. Here I'm showing them all on the plane, but you're right, They're, they could be sort of perturbed off the plane. Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to note. Um, so this here, using this L2 norm to find the approximation to our data sort of assumes that we have Gaussian noise added to our data set. Because this is the optimal thing to do if you have Gaussian noise, is to minimize the sum of squared errors. Um, if we don't have Gaussian noise, then, this, then doing PCA is no longer optimal. And so that's what these other extensions uh, try to do, is incorporate additional noise information when solving these problems. And so robust PCA just assumes a small number of data points live off of the plane. And so you have a way of basically handling that. So it's sort of an outlier rejection combined with PCA. You could think about it in that way. Um, the second thing that uh, is an extension of PCA is called factor analysis. And basically what factor analysis assumes is that it assumes that the noise added to each of our data points might not have equal variance. So before we had Gaussian noise, which is sort of, um, we assume that the variance of the noise is equal across all of the different coordinates. And so what this allows us to do is still fit a model even if we have different amounts of noise added to different coordinates of each of the points that we're trying to reduce the dimensionality on. So I kind of show that here in the sense that the noise perturbation could be very large in one direction and perhaps small in another one. So factor analysis is the right thing to do when you have noises of unequal variance. And then the third one, um, which is also quite popular, is non-negative matrix factorization that's still finding a linear fit to the data. Uh, but now we're going to assume that both the data and the principal components, or the factors that we learn, are non-negative. So they all live in this um, positive orthant of the, of the space. So these are three kind of common extensions of PCA. I wanted to add them in because I think it's important to know that when you do PCA, you are assuming a you're assuming that your data is, has Gaussian noise added to it. And if that's not true, you know, um, it might give you a result that is not meaningful or perhaps not the right thing to, to do with your data. Any questions on any of the extensions or any other linear dimensionality reduction? 
All right, cool, because we're going to step now into the next level of complexity, which is now assuming instead of having a linear subspace, we could have a curved surface or what's called a manifold to represent our data. Who's, who's heard of manifold learning? So I feel like I might be sort of preaching to the choir here. I think a lot of you guys know, know a lot about this, but um, I still think it's, it's useful to perhaps have this geometric perspective. Maybe that's a bit different from what you've seen. Okay, so, um, so instead of you know, things living on a linear subspace, now they're going to, we're gonna try to find data sets that might have nonlinear structure. Um, so manifolds and uh, some algorithms to do that include isomap and also local linear embeddings. I'm going to talk a bit about isomap, um, but there are a wide range of different manifold learning techniques you can use. Okay, so we're going to go again to this objective function, and what is this saying? Um, it's basically saying that we're going to find some sort of projection of our data. It's not necessarily a matrix that we're multiplying by the data any longer because it could be a nonlinear transformation. Um, where basically if I look at two data points, yi and yj, in this original space as measured by some distance, um, under this transformation of those data points, we want this, the, the difference between different uh, two data points in our original data space to be roughly equivalent to one another in the lower dimensional space. And so what we'll talk about now is what is this d, because it's not just using Euclidean distance any longer, it's actually um, measuring what's called the geodesic distance on our, on our data space. Okay, so in order to talk about the geodesic distance, I'll give an example. So uh, this is a very characteristic or uh, a, a common example that people use within manifold learning. It's this Swiss roll, so basically the data points are distributed in this sort of curved surface. Um, this is, these are some pictures coming from this. It's a MATLAB uh, numerical tours. Um, I have links at the end, but there's some kind of cool stuff you can play around with in MATLAB if you're interested in this. Okay, so what you do is for all of your data points, you first start by computing this thing called the K nearest neighbor graph. Basically what you say is like, I want to connect all data points that are within, or that are my, K, k nearest neighbors from each other data point. And uh, so you fix k, that's a user specified parameter. And then for each of these data points, you can see it's connected to some number of its nearest neighbors according to its Euclidean distance at this point. So you just say, okay, who are my nearest neighbors? And now I'm gonna build a graph saying how they're all connected to each other. And so this is just a visualization of that graph. Um, and now the geodesic distance, which is basically what, the ISO, what ISOMAP is using to do this dimensional reduction, is basically instead of moving anywhere in space, uh, like the Euclidean distance, the geodesic distance has to stay on the manifold. So I think it sort of is, I put it over here. So if we have some sort of curved surface, right? These are all of our data points. Um, if we were just measuring L2 distances, then we might say that you know, this point and this point are actually quite close to one another, right? Because in, if I just measure their L2 distance, they're actually uh, not that far apart from one another. But if I instead ask for you to stay on this curved surface when I measure the distances, they're actually very far apart, right? Because I'd have to go all the way around, all the way to here. So my geodesic distance can look very different from my Euclidean distance if I have something that's very curvy and um, you know wraps around something like this. And so the way to compute the geodesic distance is you have this nearest neighbor graph and then you basically are now going to say, on the graph, what is the shortest path from one point to another on the graph? So you can use something like Dijkstra's algorithm to find these shortest paths once you've computed your nearest neighbors. Did you, did you have a question? Okay, oh, which is how would you actually compute that? 
So that's why you need to compute your k-nearest neighbors graph first, and then you can basically apply some existing techniques to then compute this geodesic distance. And now, just like we did before, where we looked at our covariance of our data in terms of the L2 distances, we would form that same similarity matrix again, but now it's using the geodesics rather than just their Euclidean distances. Yes? One thing that I noticed is the difference between this and the linear thing is if the linear thing is true and you sample it super sparsely and you fit it, you'll get exactly the right answer. Mm. If this thing is That's true a great, yeah. and sampled sparsely, you'll get some garbage or something, yes. That's a, that's a great point. So um, a lot of the sort of earlier algorithms for manifold learning were very susceptible to sparse sampling. There are ways to sort of um, get around it by perhaps setting uh, adaptive window sizes over different parts of the manifold. So you need to have some parts of it that are densely sampled enough. If everything's just very sparsely sampled, it, it will be very hard to pull out this nonlinear structure. But then also at the same time, you know, if you have things living on some nonlinear surface, you've only observed a few points, it would be hard to say that they even came from <laughs> from that nonlinear structure. But yeah, no, there's a, there's a, a, de does, a does dependence on the number of parameters of this thing somehow? Oh, the sampling complexity? Yeah. Or, or just the fact that to describe this thing you need more parameters than to describe the uh, surface. Yeah, so there are a few things. Uh, one is the actual dimensionality of the underlying structure, so that's one piece. Um, and so uh, the gap between your ambient or your original dimension, and if you have a very low dimensional structure, say a two dimensional structure, maybe you also need less points. Um, and then there's also dependence here in terms of the sampling on uh, the curvature of the manifold. So you have something that curves a lot, it's going to be harder to estimate. I don't have those numbers offhand for you, but there have been some, some work that's tried to estimate sample complexity based upon the dimensionality of the surface, the curvature, and, and, and um, yeah. But then even then you're sort of assuming, okay, now I'm uniformly distributing points. And which doesn't, in some practical applications, maybe there's a whole gap in your manifold that you, that's very hard to sample. Uh, and so then I will say to that point, there's also been a lot of work on adaptive sampling, which says, you know, if I am trying to estimate a manifold or something else, what are the next samples I need to acquire in order to fill in gaps? So if you have, if you have control over where you sample, then maybe you could still get around some of these issues. And you need to put more samples in places where you have more curvature and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, yes? Have a lot of data, yeah. Otherwise, you can figure out what the thing you're making is. Yeah. Um, and deep learning is even trickier as well, right? Because then, even when you do learn it, you're not entirely sure what all these weights and parameters mean either. Um, I'll talk a little bit at the end about some neural network sort of approaches for doing dimensionality reduction, but I won't really yeah, dig into those sorts of questions, but that's a good point. Oh, yes. No, no, I'm not. Model selection is a very important <laughs> uh, question, but that's something that we won't talk about now. But if you're interested in talking offline, or you know, we might have time as well to kind of have a discussion about that. Yes? Yeah, so that was just, yeah, that was the question that he was just asking. Um, so, I'm not gonna talk about it in detail here, but basically there are these different criterion that people will use for model selection. Um, basically it's a combination of how well am I fitting my data, and then also a term that controls the number of new parameters or the number of degrees of freedom that I've added into my model. So things like the BIC or AIC are kind of generic tools for model selection and those can be applied within these sorts of settings. Um, but yeah, it's something that 
there's, so I'll talk about some stuff that I did during my PhD, which is sort of an extension of some of this, where we do have ways of actually seeing what the right value of k typically is, um, but that's not always true for all for all methods. So you're right, you could choose a different value k, you get a different answer. And so perhaps the interpretability or perhaps something about how you're, uh, as you add in more factors, there's a sort of diminishing returns property where I'm adding in more factors, but it doesn't actually help me in terms of my, my model that much, right? You're always gonna get just a little more. So you can kind of look at these curves and see a point where it sort of bottoms out in terms of improvements. Okay, but yeah, those are great questions. Um, okay, and so here we've now computed these geodesic distances, that's our, um, that's our similarity matrix, and then we're gonna do exactly the same thing as we did before with PCA. We're gonna compute the leading eigenvectors of this new matrix, and then using those two leading eigenvectors, that tells me the sort of optimal embedding of my data into, say, two dimensions, and so this is basically now taking that Swiss roll structure and unraveling it into a 2D plane. So that's sort of the goal of these methods is to get to a point where you have a nice low dimensional embedding of this curved surface. And so the theme with a lot of these things is figuring out how to compute a good similarity matrix, which might not be L2, right, which is what we use for PCA, but having all these different ways of computing a, a similarity matrix, and then you just do the same stuff. You do eigenvalue decompositions, or you'll see another version of it as well. But this is really sort of the, I don't know, the art of some of these methods is understanding how to best characterize distances between points that might not just be a simple distance measure. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's Euclidean uh, when sort of viewed through this geodesic distance in, in that sense. Because basically if I, if I know the distance between this point and this point in terms of my geodesic, I would now say in the lower dimensional uh, space, I want those two distances to be about the same distance apart, right? Well, so um, I guess I didn't, I didn't draw the same thing here, but so if I started here at these red points and then I asked how far are the blue points, right? After I've embedded, or sorry, after I've reduced the dimensionality, now the distance that I have to travel in Euclidean space is equivalent to the distance I had to travel in that geodesic. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's the flavor of most of these algorithms is you, you, you have a clever way of computing the distance such that you can use the standard machinery afterwards. And then yes, those assumptions about things being locally uh, uh, approximated or approximated by the, the geodesics being described in terms of the Euclidean distance once you've done the dimensionality reduction, if that makes, if that makes sense. Um, I guess you, I'm not as familiar with some of the other approaches. I'm, I'm sure that there's other ways of going about doing this, but I wanted to sort of paint the high level view of computing this affinity or the similarity matrix is usually the sort of innovation and novelty that come out of these different manifold learning techniques and then a lot of it sort of follows the same set of or sequence after that. So yes. Oh that's a good question. Um, so this is this is actually something that I will talk about in the context of a neural data application. So I think, I'm, I hope that I'll be able to answer your question more, uh, you know, more concretely. 
but I will say that once we get down into a two-dimensional space, this thing could be rotated in any direction. So I think that sort of gets at what you're describing, right? So you, you know the, the leading coordinates that you want to embed the data in, but, um, but where in this plane that data lies is not... We don't necessarily know which way. Once we reduce the dimensionality, you don't know which way it'll sort of <laughs> you know, lay out um, in, in this low dimensional space. Although, with that being said, you know, your first eigenvector is the one that has the most variance, and your second eigenvector has less variance. And so there is, uh, in terms of the coordinate system, there is this notion that the order of the eigenvectors and those coordinates matters. Okay, so that was the sort of overview of manifold learning. Um, okay, the next thing, doing very good on time, is to think about clustering in this same sort of framework. So a lot of times we think about clustering the data because there are different groups or subsets of the data that have kind of similar structure or are homogenous in some way. We can also think about clustering and things like k-means, which is an a sim very simple algorithm to cluster our data. We can think about these in a sort of geometric way as well, which is that in this high dimensional space, instead of things living sort of smoothly or continuously along one of these surfaces, now they're sort of isolated in these different pockets within the space, so shown here. And um, one way to write this out, this is a little more hairy and complicated in terms of the objective function, but basically what this is saying is that I want to find a partitioning of my data such that the distance from the cluster center of all the clusters that I've learned and the data points that are associated with that cluster, I want the, that L2 distance to be minimized across all of the clusters. So this is basically saying, I'm gonna sum over all the data points I within some subset given by a similar set of steps in terms of the algorithms. Okay, so what k-means does is it starts by just randomly initializing the cluster centers. So you say, I want k clusters, and I would come up with k random vectors. And then I'm gonna assign each data point to its closest cluster center. I'm going to update the cluster centers based upon the mean of all their assigned points. And then I'm gonna iterate steps two and three until I converge. And converge basically means that as I go forward, I'm not moving where the cluster centers are very much any longer. And so this is, this is called Floyd's algorithm. It also has connections to th vector quantization, if that's something that, you know, just a buzz word for people to look at. But it seems kind of messy, right? I mean, it's not a very, it's an iterative algorithm. There, there, are, there are some proofs of convergence, but only to local minimum, because this is a non-convex problem with a lot of potentially bad local minima that we could get trapped in. But surprisingly, k-means actually does a really good job of clustering most data sets. And, um, you know, and for that reason, a lot of people have sort of built upon this framework and added in additional metrics or distances to measure. Uh, okay, so this is, this is the rough overview of k-means. Any questions about clustering, how to cluster data? Cool, I think this one is a, a lot more familiar to most. Why, why is it Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so so part part of it is I'm just saying, you know, my data doesn't live everywhere. It actually lives in some isolated subsets of this space. And so this is one example where your data has some specific structure. But one thing you could then think about is, and this is connected to this idea of vector quantization, is that if I now, instead of representing all of my data, I just use the cluster centers, then now I have a k-dimensional representation. And I also know all the data points that are close to it. So I could basically go about doing some analysis just on the centroids now. So 
Oh, okay, so it's a slightly different. Okay, so it's if I have a thousand data points, right, of three of 300 dimensions, I think you said. I, I'm now, instead of having all 1,000 of those data points, I have five of them, but they're still 300 dimensional. So I haven't, I haven't reduced the dimensionality in that sense. Of the whole set, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. And also part of it too is I wanted to talk about some stuff that I think is really cool, which is an extension. It's sort of a generalization of PCA, and it's a combination of PCA and clustering. So talking about clustering was important for me to get here as well. <laughs> okay, so this last, this last low dimensional model that I talk about is called unions of subspaces. This is work that I did during my PhD, so it's very near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and so basically the idea behind unions of subspaces is that maybe my data doesn't live on a single plane, but it might actually live on more than one plane. And so it's this mixture model, which sort of both models data as sort of belonging to clusters, and then it also models them as being low dimensional subspaces. And so one of the motivations or the early motivations for these union of subspaces models um, could be sort of nicely demonstrated in an example where you have pictures of faces that are all captured under different illumination conditions. And so basically the idea is that there's a very, uh, a small number of degrees of freedom which describe how data will be visualized if I just change the illumination condition. So people have looked at this and they said, okay, I have an object under different illuminations that lives on a nine to 10 dimensional subspace. And so the idea is if I have a large collection of data with many different people's faces, each of the collection of uh, each face under all the different illuminations will each live on a different subspace. So unions of subspaces could be used to then take a large corpus of images of faces and divide it into um, the different identities of different people. There are other cases where this comes up um, as well. We've applied it also to LIDAR or for remote sensing applications. And um, you know, and are also really interested in using this in neural data context, which I won't have too much time to talk about. So, um, but so this is the model for the data. So it's basically this mixture of subspaces and also clusters. And now our, our objective function gets a little trickier, but, but basically it's just now saying I'm gonna partition my data into different sets. Each of those will have their associated low rank approximation. And my goal is to both figure out how to partition the data and then I'll just do a PCA or some other linear dimensionality reduction on each of those clusters of data. We're all, okay. Okay, and so again, I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons why I think this is interesting to think about, given our last example, is again, it kind of boils down to how do you form this affinity or similarity matrix between different examples in your data set? And basically, some of the algorithms which apply um, notions of, of sparsity and sparse reconstructions will most of the work is in how you compute this affinity matrix, and I can go into I can go into a little detail on that. Basically, what we do is we we say that okay, if data points live in a subspace, they should all be able to use one another in their sparse representations of an, of another data point living on the same subspace. So what that means is that if I take a data point and now I say, okay, I wanna sparsely represent myself in terms of all these other examples I've seen, I should use other examples from my space, right? Or my, my face <laughs> should be used to, to generate a new picture of my face, or I should only use other data points that live in the same subspace. And so what you do is you, you create the affinity matrix by running a sparse recovery program for each data point. And then what this is showing along the rows are all the other data points that I've selected to represent myself. So if this was a perfect process in the way that we've done it, we have, you know, 
equal number of faces of two different faces under different illumination. Uh, so and they're ordered. So if we did a good job, we'd have a perfectly block diagonal matrix here. And um, what you find is if you just look at, say, nearest neighbor relationships amongst your data points, you don't get this really nice block diagonal structure. And so it makes it very hard to actually pull out the different clusters or the different groups from the data. And then using the, these sorts of algorithms that we proposed in this paper, so this is 2013, we could, uh, we could show that we could get these really nice similarity matrices using this idea, and then you could go about clustering it and then finding the low dimensional representations. Yes? So clusters are different faces or different So each collection of faces will have its own subspace. And, the, and basically, the illumination will tell you where in that subspace you are. So I guess just going back here, you would have many different, so a, a picture of this person's face under these different illumination conditions will each produce a different one of these green points. And then someone else's face under different illumination will produce all these different purple points. And they live on these different subspaces. And when it gets hard is when they intersect. Oh, we don't know a priori. So it's an unsupervised. Yeah. So you just imagine you have a lot of images of faces, and now you're trying to do facial recognition. Uh, but you don't know whose face is what. Then this would be the sort of yeah unsupervised setting for that. Uh, so. So what's kind of interesting here is that when you solve this sparse recovery problem, it actually gives you a really nice way of knowing when to stop selecting more coefficients. Or even if you do over-select, you tend to have uh, very small coefficients for those residual points. And so in this example, actually looking at the dimensionality or the number of non-zeros gives you a good estimate of the dimensionality of the subspace. but. Um, when then running your PCA or whatever, you need to specify K. And then you go back into those same questions of, you know, what is the right value of K for which I get diminishing, or I, I sort of reach the point where if I add more factors in, I get diminishing returns. And then are the subspaces including or do they share some dimension? So, yeah, so that's a good question. When they are. Uh, when they're independent, this is an easy problem, and you can usually just do it with k-means or other clustering algorithms, because as long as the data are separable, then they sort of fit more into that earlier uh, problem setup. But in but in cases where you have shared code or co-dimension uh, across the different subspaces, then the problem is harder, and so using these sort of more sophisticated ideas for forming the similarity similarity matrix become more critical. All right, so, okay, so the last thing I wanted to quickly talk about in terms of low dimensional models is uh, this idea which has become popularized with the advent or ease of use, I guess you could say, of uh, deep learning and convolution or neural networks in general. And so basically what people claim in a lot of dimensionality reduction that uses neural networks or even in supervised architectures where you want to do object recognition is that your data actually doesn't live on any of these nice models <laughs> that I described before, but it's actually on these weird interconnected and tangled manifolds. So it's sort of, I mean, there are ways to take this union of subspaces model and convert it into unions of manifolds. And so that kind of becomes closer to this tangled manifolds idea. The, the idea of you know, a lot of these models of convolutional neural networks as a sort of way of modeling vision, right? And the, the transformation of visual content from early visual areas all the way up into areas like IT, which are responsible more now for 
uh, object level recognition rather than sort of lower level features is this idea that as the brain transforms input coming in from the retina in, in primary visual areas all the way into these higher areas, you're basically taking these collections of data, maybe this red one is, uh, I don't know what this example is here, I should have looked at it more carefully, <laughs> but let's just say again it's the you know pictures of uh, cats and dogs, right? Initially they're highly entangled in the pixel space, but as we start moving up to higher levels of representation, these two different structures become untangled, and then in within this neural network we can now recognize and identify cats and dogs at these higher levels of abstraction within neural networks. And so this is yet another sort of low dimensional model, and how we actually get at that within neural networks is, a, is perhaps a little less or is not well understood in all cases. But I wanted to just talk about this as a sort of extension because I think a lot of you might be excited about deep learning and, and so I wanted just to show how this stuff is instantiated within these more modern uh, ML techniques. And so the way that we do that in the unsupervised setting, which I've been talking about, is through the use of autoencoders. The idea is basically you feed in data into an input layer, you also have an output layer, there could be many layers in between, but basically as you, as you sort of look at how many nodes or how many, uh, yeah, how many nodes are in each of these layers, you start to move towards a sort of bottleneck. And so this idea that you start with something high dimensional and you eventually move to something lower dimensional is very much in line with what we've been talking about. And basically once you get to this bottleneck within your neural network architecture, this would be considered your latent space. And then the idea is to basically dig into what's going on in this latent space and that's basically your representation of your data that you formed, but it's been do done through this highly complicated and nonlinear function approximator. And so so roughly speaking, the sort of objective here of autoencoders is to put in data and then get something at the output that looks like your input, but it can do it through some nonlinear transformation. And so you're basically trying to find a function which gives you a good agreement between your input and your output within the inner or the input and output of the autoencoder. Yes. It's symmetric. Right. So it's using the same weights, mm -hmm. learning, and then just uh, making sure it gets a larger dimension. Yeah. That's that's the basics that I understand. I mean there there could be perhaps asymmetric autoencoders, but you'd need to somehow constrain it to have similar weights. I don't know if anyone plays with these things and kind of knows an answer to that, but um, what I understand is just the sort of basic autoencoder framework. You, you learn the forward process and then you just replicate it at the output to get back to the high dimensional space. And then I just wanted to mention here just to kind of bring it back that if we just consider a single hidden layer and we don't consider nonlinear uh, activations or anything like that, then basically we could represent PCA as an autoencoder or any of these linear or matrix factorization based approaches where basically we would have the forward transform going here into the low dimensional space and then something which would help, which would expand it back out. And so you could think about this PCA as an autoencoder, but a very simple one that's linear and has very nice mathematical properties. <laughs> Okay, so I just, I just wanted to sort of bring that up as a, just a final, a final point. Okay, and it looks like I'm running low on battery. Take a, a minute break. Any other questions while I'm rejuicing? So we still have about, yes? Just wondering whether it has been proven So some of the limited amount of theory that's been 
carried out for um, deep learning architectures will often simplify things down to this sort of more linear or uh, more uh, easier format, right? Rather than, because it's very hard to analyze these architectures when you add in all these nonlinearities. So I'm familiar with some work where they've used this sort of um, idea. But sorry, your your question was, are there proofs of the the equivalence? I think there are. Um, I can't remember of the paper off the top of my head now. Um, but we actually, so we, I don't know if Sammy will talk about it when he's here on Monday, but we have a, we've been working on some stuff together to use these sorts of autoencoder architectures for generating images of brains or for generative models. And so we actually also test it against PCA as our autoencoder. And in some cases, actually find that PCA is a better way of reducing dimensionality rather than using these highly convoluted, com convolutional architectures. So, um, but yeah, we haven't, you know, then, found the exact result using PCA versus a, a ComNet. They're, they're different. So, but yeah, we can chat more. I'm, I'm sure there's some papers to point you to. Okay, so this is sort of, this is the end of the tutorial on dimensionality reduction. And then what I wanted to do for the last 30 minutes is to go through some applications of these ideas in those two different neural data sets that I described at the beginning. Okay, so our first application is to um, movement decoding. And so the basic setup for the task and the data that we'll be using to, to do this analysis is coming from macaques. Uh, there's typically, you know, chronically implanted electrode arrays into the primary motor cortex of these subjects. And the idea is that you record neural activity. It's typically from anywhere from about 100 to maybe 200 neurons. And you know their firing rates and you know when they've emitted spikes. And uh, so you're recording that neural activity at the same time as the, the monkey is doing different reaching tasks. So in this case, we've considered a standard center outreaching paradigm where basically a, uh, the, the subject is looking at a screen. You have some sort of yellow dot that's going to move to one of eight different concentric targets. And, um, and so they're basically moving this lever towards any of those different targets that have shown up on the screen. And then at the same time, we're recording neural activity. And our goal is to basically be able to decode, so understand based upon the neural activity, then can we actually predict where the monkey's hand was moving in space? So this is the problem of deco brain decoding in general, but we're applying it in this case to a movement task. And so as the, the subject's making reaches, we can then record basically the x and the y velocity of the cursor reaches or of the, of the lever reach and what what I'll show here in the results is for each of the different target directions I've colored each of the data points according to their target direction so whenever you see purple dots that means it's moving towards that particular target and yellow and orange and, and blue and uh, so what this is showing is just what the what the velocities would look like in 2d so x and y as uh, as the subject's making reaches towards these four different targets. Make sense, the setup for the data? Okay, cool. So basically what people discovered, I mean, I think this is still a rapidly emerging field, um, but when you basically take these neural activities, so as I was showing before, we have neurons by time, and we do some sort of dimensionality reduction on them, we actually find that the distribution of those low dimensional projections matches or it resembles at least the actual shape of the movements. So what that means is that within your brain as you're making these movements in the activity of hundreds of neurons, the same shape of your movements is actually embedded or uh, lifted into this higher dimensional neural space. And so 
what's really cool about this is that that dimensionality reduction then gives us access or a window inside of the brain and how it's encoding these different movements. And so we were really excited to think about ways that dimensionality reduction could help in this movement decoding problem. And so one of the first things that you might want to do is you could just take this neurons by time matrix, you can do dimensionality reduction, and you know, hope to see the shape of the movements in these low dimensional projections. Right? And so in this case, this is a, a relatively good Lodi representation in the sense that the global structure of the task that we'd like to decode is preserved in these low dimensional projections using PCA or factor analysis or something. Um, Okay, and then, yeah, I rotated it. So, I mean, in this case, you can see more clearly that actually, you know, all these different reaches, which are, this is neural activity that's been embedded in 2D, even through this, you know, high amount of dimensionality reduction, we see basically the same shape of, of these movements in, in, the, in the neural activity patterns. But what happens in general is actually that, you know, if you just apply PCA off the shelf, this doesn't often, come out so well. <laughs> so in many cases you get these bad low dimensional representations and then a question could be, you know, how do I how do I sort of constrain my dimensional reduction steps in order to ensure that I match this sort of structure that's present in the data that I want to decode. And so as we've already gone through in a lot of detail, I mean part of it is that okay, now my my data isn't Gaussian distributed, or the noise isn't Gaussian distributed, right? So I shouldn't use PCA, and uh, so maybe my noise structure is varying, and it could be across subjects you see very different noise distributions. It could be even the same subject, but across different days you see the noise properties changing. And then also the signal might not be a perfect subspace, right? Maybe it's curved, or maybe it's more like a manifold, and so, you know, we have a major challenge in understanding what type of dimensionality reduction technique we would apply in order to obtain something that looks like our movement distribution. So what our solution was is to basically leverage the, the distribution of what we know the subject is trying to do. So we, we have information about this, we know the different reaches that they're making, and so we have a strong prior on the sort of space of those movements, and we want to use that and leverage it when we're solving our dimensionality reduction problem. Okay, so what we do in order to, to carry that out is something we call distribution alignment decoding, or DAD. And so we have a recent paper um, this, this past year, and then we also have code available on GitHub. Um, also at the end of the presentation, I'll have some links to our repo because it might be a nice test data set that some of you might want to use for your projects. And uh, there's you know smaller or larger ones, and so I can point anyone that might be interested in doing stuff like this or playing with motor cortical activity. Um, we have some data sets available. They're mat files, but should be easy to plug into Python as well. Okay, so the idea, as I was describing before, is we're gonna record the neural activity. We get some measurement of the spikes of these different neurons over time. So this is our Y matrix. What we wanna do is we wanna apply some dimensional reduction technique, which gives us this projected neural activity. And then we're gonna do something called distribution alignment to basically now take this projected neural activity and to overlay it onto the predicted move, uh, onto the, the prior distribution over our movements. So what this means is that, um, going back to your question, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know your name. Emily's question about is this sort of an arbitrary coordinate system. So this is sort of an example where, um, like here, for instance, right, where we've done dimensional reduction, we've preserved the structure in the data, but it's some rotated or a fine transformation of the actual movements of interest. And so when solving dimensional reduction, you're not guaranteed that you're gonna have a perfect overlay with your movement space, but if you do the dimensional reduction right, you're going to have a linear or an affine transformation that could be applied, so some rotation of your low dimensional projections that would then match up with the true thing that you're trying to decode. So while we might be able to guarantee we have good preservation of structure, we cannot guarantee that we have the right coordinate system. 
So we need to apply some sort of transformation to it to get it back to that correct space. So like that. <laughs> All right, so that's basically the idea here is we're doing dimensional reduction. We're going to rotate and move it around until we match the uh, prior distribution over the movements that we want to decode. And so this is just a sort of a schematic of the idea. Basically what we do is we apply the Kale divergence, which is a a measure of how well two distributions match one another. And then what we want to do is we want to rotate or apply these affine transformations until this Kale divergence between the movement distribution and our projected neural data is minimized, which will mean that we've now found a way to align these two things on one another. And this is an example just synthetic of where we have some ground truth. These are just ro just a, a single rotation uh, just in the in two space rotation of the data and then we're just looking at what does the kale divergence tell us as we rotate the data and so the other thing that this shows you is that if we measure the kale divergence across all these different rotation angles first of all the one with the smallest minimum is indeed the correct answer so it tells us kale divergence might make sense for this problem but it also shows us that there's a lot of local minima for this problem and so it's hard to solve and um, and so we needed to um, develop some tools in order to sort of get around this problem. I'm not going to go into details of that, um, but basically I just wanted to give you guys a sense of using this sort of approach, minimizing the Kale divergence between your projected neural data and your movement distribution, and this gives you a way of basically figuring out how to reduce dimensionality such that we can decode movements. So uh, the other thing that we can do is if we know what the shape of our data should look like, we can also use this for model selection. So it's a slightly different model selection than what we've been talking about. It's not figuring out the dimensionality, but there's all these other pre-processing parameters that one uses when preparing your data before you put it in this nice matrix form. And so basically we can sweep over a number of these different parameters, vary them in different ways, and then ask, okay, how closely does our data match the movement distribution? And when we get a model that also matches the movement distribution, this also gives us a way of telling us how to pre-process and select the model for our data. And so what I'm showing here is for different factorization methods. So you could have factor analysis or PCA, or in this case, we use isomap, so a, a manifold learning technique. And so for each of these, we can measure the Kale divergence, and then we can basically select the model that has the smallest Kale divergence as the one to use for processing our data. So I won't go into much detail here, but I just wanted to show this um, because it because figuring out how to choose an appropriate model for the data is hard, and so what we're using here is some prior knowledge over the movement space to kind of guide our search. Okay, so then we have some, okay, I'm still good on time. Oh, an hour and a half is very long. <laughs> Start to get, you know, throats tired after a while. Okay, so what this is is just showing the results of this algorithm that I described, the distribution alignment decoding um, for uh, two different subjects doing the same reaching task. So here we have, you know, the actual ground truth of the movements for subject M and subject C. And then we can uh, compare against this oracle, which is basically an uh, upper bound on the best case that a linear decoder could do. And um, what this linear decoder, or what this oracle decoder is using is it knows exactly the correspondence between where the monkey's hand was in space, so it's kinematics and the neural activity at the same time. So if you can measure both of those things at the same time, you can uh, just solve for a, a linear matrix which transforms them in a pretty easy way which is in contrast to what we're doing, right? Because we don't know the correspondence between the movement and the neural activity. All we know is that the shape of the movement should have a particular distribution. So in that sense, what we've done is we've proposed an algorithm for decoding that's sort of unsupervised. 
doesn't have correspondence. And then we're comparing it then to these supervised decoding strategies. So the Oracle is upper bound. The supervised decoder is a little bit worse in this case because it has less knowledge, but it still knows the correspondence between movements and neural activity. And then we compare also against a common filter, which uses additional information about dynamics. And then these two results here are for DAD. And so uh, what, we're, what we found in general, and so this I think is a good example, for instance, of uh, where we, where DAD is able to achieve similar performance to that of a, say, a supervised decoder, which has a lot more information provided to it. And so I think in general what this tells us is that we can use dimensionality reduction and these sorts of unsupervised strategies to solve decoding problems in ways that we you know, haven't uh, previously been able to do uh, with supervised decoders that have to have access to these corresponding data points between the neural space and, and the movement space that you're trying to decode. Um, and then we can also then apply this to a slightly different task with still center outreach, but it's an isometric force task where the subject's wrist is actually fixed and they're still making reaches, but it's just with their wrist. And so now the electrode is implanted in the wrist area rather than the arm area of the brain, but we actually have very similar performance in general across these two different tasks and across these three different subjects. So finally, um, just to sort of drive home the point of the, you know, these sorts of unsupervised and dimensionality reduction techniques for these types of problems. We, this is a synthetic example where we can generate neural responses. Yes? Yes? Um, in, this, in, this, uh, in the, the bottom task, is it the same space you're learning? In other words, are you learning the space in one task and applying it in the second, or are you just in the, the same method works when learning? Oh, that's a good question. So in this case, we are just doing this for the isometric force task. Um, but what we've actually found is that as long as the structure of the movement is similar, which it typically is, I mean, this one, it doesn't show as much here, but it, it also has a third dimension to it, which kind of makes some of the two dimensional projections a little bit warped. Um, but, and you know, there's some curvature here. So what we found is that it's very insensitive to the specific movement distribution. And so you could actually, that's a good, good, good point. You could use, you know, neural data from over here and then align it onto this movement distribution down here. And um, in general, we find that that's not the bottleneck. It's actually, the hardest part is getting the dimensionality reduction to work such that the alignment even makes sense. Cause there, you know, there's a lot of noise and your dimension you're reducing it down to a very low dimension. So a lot of the extensions that we're now trying um, basically try to bypass this first dimensionality reduction step and solves for the dimensionality or the low dimensional embedding and the alignment just in, in one step. And so that kind of helps get around a lot of the deficits that we see when doing this as a two stage procedure but that's also very hard, and so that's still a work in progress. Okay, so this is just showing for a, for a synthetic example, if we increase the number of neurons that we're recording from, how does the performance of DAD do in comparison to this oracle, which is this linear, or this upper bound? And so um, what we find is that as we have more and more neurons that we can record from, at least in this constrained situation, we actually approach the performance of the oracle, which is, uh, I think compelling, but also, you know, it, it gives us some, some sense that as we can actually scale up the size of our recordings, maybe these sorts of dimensionality reduction approaches will perform even better. Because right now we're sort of stuck more in this regime here where there's a larger gap but maybe if we just had more neurons, we could actually do it. And I think you know, the, some of the folks from Allen Institute who will speak next will talk about some examples where they can record from very large uh, neural populations. And so it's exciting to think about how these methods will scale. Yes? Have you tried the amount of time that you're recording for? Sorry? Instead of uh, scaling up the number of neurons, have you tried uh, the amount of yeah, that's a good point. 
Um, so what, I mean, if you have nice clean data that lives on a low dimensional subspace, you really only need just as many data points as sort of the dimension of your subspace, right? But what we found is that, you know, what, what happens is there are certain time points which are heavily skewed, right? Or there are these outliers. I don't know, it could be that maybe your spike sorting algorithm doesn't work and now all of a sudden your coordinates have been flipped or it could just be there's some noise that sort of, and so what that does is, is, is you, as you have more and more time, you're gonna have more and more data points that sort of live off of this model. So it's not always true that adding in more data is necessarily more beneficial for, um, for this learning step, but going back you know, to some of the questions that we were talking about with the sampling of, of the subspaces, I think it is true that as you have more data, you should have a sort of denser sampling of, of, the, of the subspace, and so that should help. That's a good point, though. And that's something I, I'm not showing here. Um, OK, great. So that was sort of the, the last slide for the movement example. Any other questions before I transition over into some brain observatory stuff? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think, so I think for a long time we've sort of thought about neurons in motor cortex or even in visual cortex as sort of representing some specific property of the external world or, or in the case of movements kind of the, what, what you're going, what your end effectors are going to do, right? And there have been, you know, a lot of models that basically model each of these neurons in M1 as having some tuning curve which is representative of the direction of movement. And so that's sort of been a lot of the strategy for decoding is to figure out, you know, what are each of these neurons doing and, and then characterize their representations in, in that way. And what this is showing is that basically the idea that each neuron is representing a, a, a different piece of information, while that could also be true, it's also showing that the dynamics of large populations of neurons is actually carrying all of the information, or carrying a lot of the information about the task. And it's doing it in such a way that those representations of different neurons are sort of mixed into these latent factors. And so I think the biological insights of these sorts of approaches is that using, a, uh, in this case I'm not using dynamics, but using dynamical systems or thinking about the neural population as this circuit that's sort of computing some aspects of, in this case, movement or visual coding is actually a, um, a powerful way moving forward. And perhaps, you know, without seeing the global picture of what a lot of neurons are doing to encode this, I mean, you might have a sort of sp uh, less complete view of how the brain's encoding this information. I would also say that, you know, because in the end the factors that we're learning match the movements, I mean, we do have, there's some nice sort of, at least it, it makes sense that, we, so one thing that we haven't done is then gone back and then said, okay, so within this latent factor, or this direction in this low dimensional space, sort of which neurons seem to be part of that sort of uh, representation, right? And so it is mixed, but digging a bit more into those sorts of questions I think is an interesting area for, for research and doing these sorts of things, so good question. Okay, so then I'm going to talk a bit about some work that we're currently doing on applying dimensionality reduction techniques to visual coding, so this, you're gonna hear a lot more details about the, about the data set, so I'll just do a very quick pass through. Basically, what we're using is the Allen Institute's Brain Observatory. Um, roughly speaking, you know, uh, so there, there's actually recordings in many different visual areas. This is going to focus on primary visual cortex. So it's very similar. We had primary motor cortex, and you know, now we're looking at these low-level visual areas as well. And uh, basically, the idea is that uh, they have a mouse that's watching different um, visual stimuli. There's 
combinations of either you know things like gratings and things that are a bit more parametric and constrained and then in conjunction with that they also have a lot of natural movies and natural scenes that they show to the mice all the meanwhile they're recording using two photon calcium imaging the activity of these populations of neurons and so we have a similar type of data right where we have individual neurons and we can look at their firing rates or look at their uh, fluorescence signal which is an indication of their of their firing patterns you'll hear a lot more about that later and then this is just a summed projection across many different frames within this movie that you're collecting so here you can basically see the individual neurons across these multiple frames within the movie okay so the first thing that we were interested in doing is understanding whether or not these different types of visual stimuli might produce different dimensionalities or uh, the, the neural activities might live on different dimensional subspaces. And so in this example, what I'm showing here is just if we look at the SVD, so look at the sorted singular values for the neural population across these different types of stimuli. So we have uh, looking at across all the stimuli, just static gratings. So something like this, where you'd have different angles over which the grating would be uh, traversing. And then we also looked at natural scenes, which is this yellow curve here, as well as natural movies. And what we found consistently is that, you know, these natural scenes and movies tend to do have a sort of lower dimensional representation than some of the rest. And in particular, you see a lot of uh, kind of correlated firing amongst the neurons in the case of the natural movies. And so, for this sort of preliminary analysis, we sought to look at um, the, this particular category of natural movies and try to dissect some of the things that are happening within these populations. And so the first thing that one could do is to basically take all, so in this case I had 212 different neurons and run PCA or some other type of dimensionality reduction on it. Uh, the issue is here, whereas you know in the motor cortex we had we knew exactly what we were looking for, right? We knew what the distribution of movements would look like. In the case of natural movies or these visual data sets, um, they're much higher dimensional, and so it's not entirely clear what sort of factors you would expect to get. And so what this is showing is just all the different time points each color coded based upon where in the movie they were located. And so you have things at the beginning of the movie in blue and things at the end of the movie in yellow. And what this shows you is that, you know, at least when we color code according to this axis, which is just one to start with, we have a lot of um, directions that are sort of mixed across these different portions of the movie. And so this is, you know, one initial pass at trying to reduce dimensionality of, of these visual neural data sets. So once we saw this, you know, we were interested in whether or not these ideas of subset selection or throwing away some of the neurons would actually help in our dimensionality reduction steps. So what we did is we did a cluster analysis on the neurons. So what I'm showing here are different neurons and whether or not they're highly correlated in terms of their firing activity with other neurons. And so this is now kind of showing this somewhat nice block diagonal structure. And so we basically clustered all these neurons, which is just a subset of the total neurons. The rest didn't have a clear cluster that they lived in. And so then we took these data. Well, okay, so here I'm basically overlaying the identity of the neurons in each of these clusters onto space. So the one thing to point out is that it seems as though the neurons that are sort of functionally connected to one another are firing uh, at similar rates at different points in time are kind of dispersed across the field of view. So it's not that a cluster of neurons that are kind of firing together are in one portion of space and then another cluster somewhere else. They're actually distributed. And, um, and so that's one thing to note here. And that's something that's been observed, at least in terms of the orientation tuning or other properties of neurons, is that there's sort of this distributed representation. And 
in primary visual cortex in mouse. And so what we did is we took the neurons that came out of this cluster analysis and then we applied dimensionality reduction to those. And so what we found here is that once we did a subset, once we applied this to a subset of the neurons, we actually get a much better separation in terms of the different parts of the movie in these low dimensional projections. And so that at least is a nice starting point in sort of revealing this uh, important aspect, which is that you know when there are d uh, coordinates in your representation that are sort of not part of this low dimensional representation, it's important to either know how to get rid of them or incorporate some of these other models that I described before that use other types of noise models when finding low dimensional representations. And so then we can also look at, if I just take a subset of the data as my training, learn a low dimensional model and now apply it to a test set, so another set of trials that have been held out, what do these different dimensionality reduction techniques give us? And so if we do that on a subset of the data, we both find that the training set has this more well isolated structure and then it also is very similar on, uh, on the test data set. And then if we do this for all of the neurons, we both find a lot more sort of mixing across all the dimensions. And then we also find that upon train and test, the, the representations are shifting a lot more. So this kind of tells us that doing some good subset selection before we apply these methods is really useful for producing more stable representations and ones that sort of seem to better tease out the different relevant directions in, in the data set. Okay, and it looks like one thing I forgot to do when preparing my slides was to finish my summary. Uh, so I don't have that here. <laughs> so in summary, <laughs> Um, so the first part, you know, we went through all these different low dimensional models. We talked about linear and also nonlinear or manifold models, talked about extensions to this idea of mixtures of unions or unions of subspaces, some algorithms and some concepts that are relevant when deciding, you know, what type of dimensionality reduction technique you might use. And then in the latter part, we went through some examples of applying this to movement data sets and also to visual cortex data sets as well. And um, yeah, so that's that's uh, conclusions there. So uh, the work on movement decoding was done while I was uh, doing my postdoc with Conrad Cording, who's now at UPenn. Also, Lee Miller and his lab collected the the motor cortex data, and then also another postdoc in the lab who's now at DeepMind, Mohammed Azar. And then we're also working now with Suskia DeVries and some other folks over at Allen Institute to uh, kind of work on these using these tools in, uh, in, visual, in visual data sets as well. Um, and so I guess we'll, I'll put my slides on online, but also I just have you know, some references for either useful tutorials in Python and MATLAB on some of these different things that I described. I, if you're a MATLAB user, I really love this toolbox from um, Laurens van der Matten. So he wrote the TSNE paper that some might know about, but he also has a really comprehensive toolbox which basically has 30 or more methods for dimensionality reduction, which, you know, and he has a nice wrapper for them. So that's, that's a really useful tool. And then we also, if anyone's interested, we have these data sets, at least for the movement decoding piece um, on GitHub. And so if anyone's interested in using those for your projects or just moving forward, definitely reach out to me, but I'll also have a link here just to the demo data. And then we have some extended ones that you might choose to play with. And, uh, and then, you know, some nice reviews on dimensional reduction for neural data, and then a link to our paper as well. Um, I might add some more here before I post the, the slides online so you guys can have some things to look at. And then with that, I will, um, I'd like to thank you all and thank you so much for inviting me. It's been really a, a pleasure to see all the different things that, you know, that that everyone's talking about here and seeing it all fit together. So thank you. Any more questions? I'm happy to. Yes. On what? <laughs>
Um, so, so, okay, so one thing that I didn't actually talk about here is, um, is like things like sparse PCA. Um, and so basically you can put some constraints on on the factors or the representations, either it be at the, okay, so if we have some matrix and we just want to decompose it into, let's say, a set of this low rank representation, right, times these coefficients, which would tell us how we use the low rank representation or the basis vectors to describe each of our data points, right? And so basically here, let's just imagine that it, uh, you had two different groups and you would like to assume that the factors that you use for representing group one are are, the, are similar or the same and then the factors that you might use to represent another set of subjects in a different group might be different. So there are, there are a number of techniques that basically use what's called group sparsity as a way of sort of constraining all of the non-zero coefficients in X to be um, basically the same non-zeros within a group and then you could have a different set of non-zeros for another group. You don't a priori know which of the different basis vectors you'll use or you don't know for a group which are the relevant principal components that best describe the data. You just know that they should all be the same. And so, yeah, there are techniques in uh, group sparsity that can be used for imposing that sort of structure. So that's, um, that's one example. Um, I don't know if anyone else has other group level dimensional reduction ideas. I don't. Um, yeah, so it's sort of a mixture of unsupervised but with having some known structure on the data. So, But I'm happy to point you towards those sorts of things. I think also Gael has done some work. I know he's done some stuff with group sparsity, but I don't know if they've used it for um, like PCA or... Yeah, oh yeah, that's a good... So, I mean, I was talking about these alignment techniques, which are ways of measuring differences between distributions, right? You could also do a similar thing where if you have, if you know your group structure, right, you have a collection of data, which is group one, you have a collection of data, which is group two, you could fit two models to them, and then you could ask, okay, what's the distance between these models? And there are ways of doing that. So that's one way of comparing two groups. Or you could do this in a distributional sense, so you could say, okay, could I align one sub group of subjects onto another or and then how far away are they after doing this? So, so yeah, I think if you know your group structure and you want to treat each of those groups independently, you can do all this same analysis, right? Fit models and then compare them. So that would be another, I guess, example of... And then I, pres I mean, or you could, you could actually fit a model for a group and then you could apply that same model to the second group and ask which of those principal components or which of those factors are still representative perhaps of the, of the second group of cohorts or something like that, yeah. Other questions? We had a lot of questions throughout, so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really cool. That's a really cool 
problem, but I, I would hope to, I, I hope to talk more about that. Um, we were doing a little bit of simpler stuff, like going into where these neurons were sort of, you know, their receptive fields, and then pulling out some properties of the images, right? And then maybe, you know, looking, we were looking at hog features, so histogram of orienting gradients, so, which would basically just be a distribution of what are the orientations within this patch of the image, right? So you could do these sorts of more, um, handcrafted approaches potentially and that would be a starting point but I think you know what you're describing is a really exciting you know new direction for using these sorts of ideas within these types of stimuli that aren't really as well described with simple parameters I could envision as you were describing right having sort of these autoencoders or neural networks that sort of reduce each of them jointly and then tries to find alignment or sort of similarities across the two in the latent space. And this is something we are working on to some extent, but not for this set of problem. But there are, there's some nice literature that's now showing kind of how to take multiple modalities through neural networks or through architectures and then find correspondence in the latent representations. And so, yeah, that, that would be really exciting to, <laughs> to be able to do. Thanks. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any three of us had a couple of ideas to do some sort of learning. And